So for the labs in this course, we are going to use Google Cloud. Um, you know, in a traditional class like this, uh, and even your textbook talks about using virtual machines, like you use Oracle VirtualBox, or you might use VMware Workstation or something like that. And many of you probably have used some of those platforms. But for this class, I like to use Google Cloud. It's a, you know, we're all remote. We're, we're all from home, right? It, and for a variety of reasons, it's just a lot easier to use Google Cloud. The only downside for Google Cloud is you're going to have to set up an account. Um, so what you're going to do is you're going to you're going to go to cloud.google.com. You're going to create an account. Now, if you have a Gmail account, right, or any Google account, it could be Google Music, it could be the account you use on your Android phone. It doesn't matter. You can use the same account. So any Google account will work in Google Cloud. And once you sign in the first time, uh, in order to create virtual machines, you are going to have to put a credit card number. In. Now I'm going to tell you that. Um, if you've never used Google Cloud before, uh, they're going to ask you for a credit card number, but they are not going to charge you anything. They're going to give you a $300 credit that you have a period of time to use. And I will tell you that this class, unless you accidentally leave a machine on with a ton of horsepower, you're not going to go through that credit. So in all likelihood, this isn't going to really cost you anything. Um, and even if you run out of that credit, they will not automatically charge you. You will have to go in and you'll have to manually put in your credit card number again in order for them to start charging that credit card automatically. I think the asking for a credit card is more of a, um, uh, it's more of a uh, validation that you're a real person, right? You're not just an automated system creating an account. Now, if you have any trouble with getting, you know, if you don't have a credit card, you don't know somebody who has one, you can't do that. For some reason, there's, a, uh, there's some friction on doing that. Let me know, and we'll figure out another way for you to get access to Google Cloud. But I think for the vast majority of you, um, you know, what I'm asking you to do here is really not unlike buying a textbook, right? Um, you know, I and really the textbook for this course is relatively cheap. It's Jones and Bartlett. It's not an expensive textbook, uh, so just think of this as just another another part of you know the course, right? Of course, materials. But like I said, it, it probably is not going to cost you anything to use this for this course. Unless you've used Google Cloud and you've already used up your your credits, right? And if that's the case, if you want to try this on AWS or which is Amazon, if you want to try it on Azure, um, I can create videos for those platforms as well. I recommend Google because it's the cheapest and it's pretty easy to use. So once you create your account, you're going to go to console.cloud.google.com. When you go to console.cloud.google.com, it's going to come up and look something like this. So you're going to get this console window that comes up. And in the upper left-hand side, you're going to have the little hamburger, right? The little navigation hamburger on the upper left-hand side. And you'll probably have something that says my first project up here, right? And you would select, you know, you can have other projects. You can see I've got a variety of projects in, uh, in mine. And here is a uh, project for CIS 285 that I created. Um, so I'll click on that one. But you can use my first project if you like. It doesn't really matter. So when you click on the little hamburger up here, um, and even if you do nothing with the project over here, you click the little hamburger, you're going to scroll down and look for compute engine, right? So on the left hand side, we're going to scroll down, you're going to find compute engine, you can either just click compute engine, or you can go over here and click VM instances, it doesn't matter, they're both going to take you to the same page, it's going to start you on the VM instances page. Now when the VM instances come up, so you can see I've never used this before. So it's going to ask me what I want to do, right? I don't have any VM instances. The first thing I want to do is create a new virtual machine, right? So I'm going to click on create. It's going to take a second to come up. I have to give my machine a name. So I'm going to call this, uh, I don't know, I'll just call mine CIS 285 CentOS 7, right? So we're going to be using CentOS 7 for our labs. Um, you cannot have uppercase letters. Uh, you can't have underscores or dots, uh, pretty much only the dash, but it'll warn you if you put something invalid in here, right? And you can't have a number on the front. If you put a number on the front, it's going to complain. It has to start with a lowercase letter. Um, but it doesn't matter what you call it. You can call it anything you like. When you come down and just make sure it's something you remember, right? So when you scroll down a little bit further, you're going to see, uh, that you can choose your machine type. So my recommendation is to use the E2 um, micro. Uh, so the micro machines, only one gig of memory. In fact, sometimes I would recommend an even smaller uh, system. Um, even this micro is pretty small. 
Um, in fact, I think you can probably go down here and select something. Uh, if you go to first generation, yeah, they have any on the first generation. You can do even smaller one virtual CPU with 614 gigs of, or me, uh, megabytes of memory. That's all we need for this class, right? So I would just do an N1 series F1 micro, and that's that's pretty much all you're going to need. You're not going to need anything crazy for this class. Now, as you scroll down for the boot disk. You're going to change this. Uh, our textbook is really written for CentOS, so we're going to use CentOS. So instead of using Debian, you're going to switch this to CentOS. You could use Debian if you want, right? Um, I'm going to choose CentOS 7 because that's what our textbook uses. Um, you can certainly use 8 if you want to try a newer one. You don't really need anything bigger than 20 gigabytes. It's perfectly fine. So you're going to select all this, right? So you're going to select CentOS 7, 20 gigabytes, and that's it. Then you're going to hit select. Everything else in here you can leave as the default. You don't really have to change anything else. So I'm using an N1 Micro. It's the smallest machine I can build. I selected CentOS uh, 7 for my, my disk. I'm going to click Create. And then I'm going to get this little window that comes up and says it's going to start creating. I got the little line, you know, the little circle spinning around over here. And if you look in the upper right where the bell is, the notification bell, it's telling me it's doing something. If I click on that, I can see it's still creating the instance. So at this point, I have to wait until the instance gets created. It's going to go pretty quick, right? You can see here, it's already created. It was that fast, right? So it very quickly creates your, your instance. Once you do that, to connect to your new machine that you just built, and I'm going to tell you that what we just did, you know, creating a CentOS system, uh, when I used to teach this class uh, in, in on campus and we would use VMware or Oracle VirtualBox, we would spend an entire evening of class just installing our CentOS uh, uh, Linux machines to use throughout the rest of the course. Um, it was a whole lab. And I, it's still a whole lab because, you know, that's the way the course is planned. But um, it's effortless now, right? I go in here, I click the couple buttons, I've got a Linux machine. If you want to build yourself 12 Linux machines, you could do that and have them all networked, right? You could have a whole network of Linux machines in here if you want, uh, if you're willing to uh, burn through your credit. Um, so the next step is we have to connect to the Linux machine. Uh, so we're going to use SSH to do that. You should have done this in your first, you know, your early Linux classes. Um, but they have a little tool right in here that you can use to connect. So I'm just going to go right in here and click on SSH and it's going to pop up a window and it's going to connect me to my machine. So you're going to get this little window saying that it's connecting. Uh, sometimes this takes a little bit of time. The first time you connect, it's generating some SSH keys and pushing them to your virtual machine. So we'll give this a second. We're almost there. It's doing the login and we're in, right? I didn't even have to log in. I'm automatically in. Now my Gmail account is brian.green at gmail.com. And that's why I logged in automatically as brian.green. Now, we don't want to use for this class because we, you know, there's a lot of stuff we're going to do that we're going to play around with the security of the, uh, of the operating system. We do not want to use the Google accounts to connect to our machines. And you're probably not going to want to use Google's built-in web-based SSH client. You're probably going to want to do something else. So the first thing I'm going to do is create a user account. Okay. So I'm going to type user add. And I'm going to create an account. I'm just going to call mine student. Oh, access denied. So I got to do sudo user add student. So now I've just created my student account. The next step is I have to set the password. So that's just the password command, right? P-A-S-S-W-D is going to create a password for the student user. I'm going to make mine something I'm not going to forget. All right, that's it. I've created a new password for that account. So I now have an account that I can use to log into the server. So the next step is I want to make this new user account that I created. I want to put them in the sudoers group. We're going to talk about this later in the term. But basically, that means that I'll be able to add, um, you know, I'll be able to run commands with the sudo command, which allows us to run uh, certain commands. So I'm going to use sudo user mod, which is going to allow me to add uh, to a group, the group that I'm going to add my user to is wheel and the username that I used was student. And that is going to put my student user into that group. So now if I log in as student, 
I'll be able to use sudo in order to run uh, commands that I need to run that you have to be root, right? That you need elevated privileges. All right, so now that that's done, the next step is I want to make this so that I can log in without using Google's tool. I want to make sure I can log in just with straight SSH from a different, uh, different utility, which I'm going to show you here in just a minute. So to do that, the first thing I need to do is, uh, is I need to change the root password, right? Because uh, Google creates this machine for us, but there is no root password yet. Um, so we have to create one. So again, I'm going to use the sudo command passwd for root. I'm going to change the root password. Again, I'm going to make this something that I am not going to forget. This is very important because if you forget this, it's a pain in the neck to reset it. Um, that's it. So now I have a root password set on my machine. Just to make this easier, so I don't have to keep typing sudo, sometimes I like to use the su command, and all I have to do is plug in that root user account that I just created, or that root user password that I just set. Oops, it looks like I typed it wrong. Let me try it again. There we go. So now that I have the pound signed in, in the uh, prompt, I'm now running as root, right? Um, in fact, if I type who am I, it says I'm root, right? Uh, even though I initially logged in as Brian Green, because I ran the SU command, I'm now running as root. Now I've got unfettered access to do whatever I need. Now, hopefully you've learned a little bit about VI in your other classes, and that's how we have to edit our text files in, uh, in Linux. Um, and just to show you, if I look at the contents of Etsy SSH, um, the file that I want to edit is SSHD config. You can see it in that list. That's the config file for SSH. So I'm going to type VI and then forward slash Etsy, forward slash SSH, forward slash SSHD config. And that's going to open up the config file for SSH. And if you scroll this down, there are two things that we're going to change in here. One is uh, we're going to scroll down until you find the line that says something about um, how you can, uh, about uh, password authentication. And we want to have that set to yes. So I'm going to delete the pound, I'm going to unpound it on this line, and then I'm going to pound it out on this line. So it says password authentication, yes. That's the first thing. We want to make sure you could just change the no to a yes on that last line. You could do it either way. And then same thing down here, challenge response authentication. I want that to be a yes, and I'm going to pound out the one that says no, because I want to make sure that does two things for me. First, when somebody tries to connect with SSH, it's going to allow them uh, to do a challenge response authentication, and it's going to allow them to use a password instead of having to use a certificate. We'll talk about certificates later on in the course. We don't want to have to worry about that yet. We're going to do it the easy way for now. Um, so you're going to change those two options. Then you're going to exit from VI. If you don't remember how to use VI, I will post a, a brief tutorial on VI for you. It'll give you kind of a refresher on how to use VI to edit text files. Uh, definitely something you want to make sure you remember how to do. We're going to be using VI throughout the course. Uh, pretty much every time we edit files is going to be in VI. There's other tools you could use as well. If you're more comfortable with a different text editor, feel free to use Yum and install a different text editor, right? I think uh, Emacs is one, right? That's a text editor some people like. I don't know if it's available, right? Yeah, it's not available, but, you know, there's all these different... I use VI. VI is you know, the, the, the one that I'm most comfortable with. But if you want to use a different one and you want to use Yum to install it, by all means, go ahead and do that. Uh, but I can't stress enough that knowing how to use VI is important because almost every Linux or Unix distro is going to have VI available. So it's that kind of that, that old standby that's always ready and you're able to use it. Now, in order to restart, so now that we've changed those configuration options for SSH, we have to restart the SSH server. In CentOS, you're going to use the systemctl command. We're going to type restart and then sshd, and that's going to restart the SSH service. Once you do that, right? So once we restart the SSHD, SSH service, now we can connect to it from our own computer. So I'm going to completely close this out. So I'm going to exit from this, right? So I'm no longer connected with SSH. Um, you can see here in the Google Cloud Console, it tells me what my external IP is. I'm going to copy that to my clipboard, and I'm going to minimize this window. Close all my other windows here. Sorry about this. <laughs> um, so the, the, the way that I like to uh, connect 
is using PowerShell. So if you're on a Windows machine, you should have PowerShell available to you. And I'm going to open this up as administrator. All right, so here's the Windows PowerShell. And just to make this easier for you to read, I'm going to go in here and I'm going to set the font size to something a lot bigger so that you can see it. I'll use 20. That should be fine. Um, so now you can hopefully see it a little bit easier in the video. Actually, it still looks a little small to me. So let me uh, let me bump this up even more for you. So let's do 28. There, that's huge. All right. So to connect with SSH, I'm going to type the SSH command. And then I'm going to put in that IP address. And actually, I missed a step here. I'm sorry. But you have to put the username first. So my user that I created was student. So it's going to be your username, at, and then the IP address. And then you're going to put in the password. Oh, you do have to say yes to accept the certificate. And your password is whatever you set up. Now, I do want to let you know as well that when you create this password for your machine, um, every password you create, because this is in Google Cloud, anybody could try to connect to your machine. It's a public IP address. Anyone will be able to connect. You must use a very secure password. If you don't, then someone will compromise your machine. Google will shut down your account. They really are not very forgiving about that. If somebody compromises your machine and starts using it to launch a DDoS attack against somebody, and we'll talk about that stuff in the course a little bit, uh, they will shut down your account and you won't be able to get it back. So make sure you use a very secure password. Put letters, symbols, numbers, and something you're going to remember. If you have to write it down, then so be it. Write it down. But, uh, but use a very secure password. Um, what I like to do is use a passphrase. So I'll write a whole sentence for my password, and that's perfectly fine. You don't have to have any symbols in it. You could just put something like, Brian Green is my favorite instructor at Camden County College, and that's a pretty good password. Um, so I'm logged in now, right? This worked. I'm able to connect, and from here, I can run the, uh, the S, and actually, we can try this, right? Remember, we put the student user in Sudor. So if I type, who am I? It tells me I'm student. And if I type sudo who am I, it's going to say that they trust me. I'm going to put my password in for student. Because I'm in the sudoers file, it works. It shows that I ran that command as root. And what I'd like you to turn in for this assignment uh, is a screenshot here showing exactly what's on my screen. So you're going to open up the PowerShell. You're going to show me that you're SSHing. It's going to show me the username that you used. It's not going to be student. Try to use your username, right? Um, something that, that uh, you know, describes you. You don't have to use your real name. You could just make something up, but, you know, just something unique for your username. Um, just show me your username, the IP address. I'm going to see that you connected. Uh, if it, It's okay if you already connected before, so I don't see this chatter up at the top about how it's the first time you're connecting. That's fine. Uh, but I want to see who am I. That username shows up, sudo who am I, and it's going to show me that it ran as root, and that's all you need to turn in for this lab. That's it. That's all I want to see. Um, and then you're done. Now, for those students that do not have Windows, if you have a Mac and you're doing these labs, you can also use a Mac to connect to your machines. Uh, Mac has, you know, the, the, the Mac OS has a built-in SSH client just like PowerShell. It's a, literally exactly the same command that you saw me run on here. All you have to do is get to the command shell on Mac, and I don't know how to do that. So if you're not sure how to do that, I'm sure you can Google it and figure it out. If not, let me know. We'll figure it out together. I, you know, I, I don't use a Mac very often, so I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. But, um, but if you have a Mac and you want to use a Mac... By all means, you can use you know a Mac if you want. If you have a Linux machine and you want to use that, great. You can connect to your machine from Linux too. It works fine, right? Just open up a shell and you know and uh, and run the exact same command I'm running here. It works the exact same way. So you can certainly do that. So you can pretty much connect to your machine from anything. Throughout the term, we're going to be using the command line interface to do almost all of our labs. So we're not going to be using a GUI. We're not going to be using a desktop. It's going to be what you're seeing on my screen here, and we'll be using that for probably the vast majority of the assignments that we do throughout the course. So that's it. So that's your first lab. And if you have any questions, let me know. And best of luck throughout the term.